Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over this weekend's UFC card. Um, I think it's taking place, it's def definitely taking place in Canada somewhere. Hopefully the fires don't, the smoke doesn't uh, cancel it. I'm sure it won't. Um, it's inside for openers. Um, I think it's a really, really good card from a DFS perspective. Um, partially because from a spectator's perspective, it's really, really good. Um, the, the reason for that is you can make, and we'll get to it, but you can make some really good lineups with kind of the later fights in the card. Um, you Not usually, but sometimes you get these kind of feature fights that are not that great from DF, from a DraftKings perspective. And you, you know, by the time you get to these later fights, you're either out or, you know, you, you've already, you know, have no chance to win the optimal. But I think the way this card sets up, it's really good from a sweat perspective because, I think you're going to want to get like a decent amount of these later fights. Um, and I think that's good. I think that's good for the, uh, it's good for the public. It's good for everybody. Um, so we're going to go through all the fights and talk about this. It's a relatively, it's a relatively, I mean, it's a big enough card, right? It's 11 fights, but I would say it's, 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 it's definitely on the small side. Um, so yes, you do need to put more of a, priority on just getting the W's as opposed to getting the ceilings, which is actually pretty important because this week there aren't that many great ceilings. Okay. There are a couple, but they're not that many great ceilings and, and the ceilings that do exist are probably going to be really, really popular. Um, but let's, uh, let's talk about it. So again, this is a really good card from a, a fan DFS perspective because this first fight of the night, it's probably one you're probably not going to want to be part of. You know, you have Oliver against Belbita, 8,200 versus 8K. Neither one of them have particularly great grappling upside. So all you're really looking at is whether there's a decent inside the distance possibility for either of these ladies. And when you look at, you know, any of the any of the metrics, any of the inside the distance props, they're all really, really poor. Um, you'll look at it, you see, I mean, fight, goes the distance is like plus 200. Um, when you look at each individual one, you have Belbita, you know, plus 500, something like that. Oliviera plus 500 inside the distance. The only thing I would say about women's fights is that you can get a decent score uh, in a stand-up fight because for whatever reason, they, they maybe it's sexist, whatever, but they give women a uh out of a nudge when it comes to classifying something as a significant strike as opposed to a regular strike they somehow sometimes like require the men to just do a little more damage for it to consider because they're a significant strike so i've seen this a bunch of times like women they'll just kind of look it'll look like some just kind of random striking affair next thing you know this woman has 100 points and uh um but it, it is going to require you know like a really good matchup like that I don't think this is particularly one of them. I think that this fight is a complete fade. Now, again, you can always make the case, especially with 11 fights, that it's going to be really low owned. So as a result, you might want to take have a piece of it. Sure, in 150 max, maybe. But in general and, and structurally, this is this fight is is definitely a fade. Um and, and the next fight, I mean, honestly, is not that great either. You you have Dvorak at 9,400 and, and Ekrag was coming in on short notice at 6,800. And you look at the, at the fight odds and you have Dvorak is minus 275. And so the, the, the price is, is reasonable given the win odds, but at 9,400, I mean, you're going to need an inside the distance prop of at least, you know, minus 110 to pay off this, this, this price in general, in, in addition to that, you probably need some grappling upside as well. And, and the metrics of this fight really do not provide for a lot of, a lot of, uh, of upside. I mean, you have fight goes to the distance is about minus, you know, one thirty. Dvorak inside the distance, like plus 200. I mean, that's like terrible, you know, and considering it really doesn't have that much wrestling upside, I suppose. I, mean, I guess you could say he's got some wrestling upside, but his opponent is 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 kind of a good wrestler himself. 
So you'd like to think that this fight just kind of either stalls out with Dvorak winning just because he's just better. Um, but if he's plus 200 inside the distance at 9,400 without the clear edge wrestling, I mean, he's probably just going to be a fade, honestly. Um, now, I, I tried. I tried to make Eckreg work. You know, he's... I guess from what people have said, he does have some good grappling. So I guess you could make the case that if he does win, he could get a good score, maybe, but he's still plus 240 to win. I mean, he's going to win only like 30% of the time. And there's no guarantee that when he does win, he's going to score all that great. So I don't know. I mean, yeah, okay. In 150 max, if you want to punt, maybe he's not that bad, but. Overall, I mean, it's just really not a great play at this. It's usually not a great play to play guys at plus 250, Ooh. honestly, unless the, the, the opponent is going to be really popular. Now, because Dvorak is, again, his metrics are so poor, you're not really gaining all that much from playing someone like Eckrick. We're going to get to better punt plays than him, honestly. Um, you could argue that he's an okay punt play because of his, his win condition, um, that he's probably, probably, I guess, going to have to take him down to win. But he still has to do that, you know, at, and, and do it enough to win, which is only going to happen 30% of the time. So I don't know. It's, uh, it's not the greatest fight in the world to target, which is good from a fan perspective, again, because if you don't, listen, you fade both these fights and you get away with it, then all of your action is kind of pushed towards the later fights, which is kind of cool. All right, uh, next one, you have Blake Builder versus Kyle Nelson. Take a look at the DraftKings price. You have 9K, 7,200. So what you're expecting to see is, you know, Blake Builder about a two-to-one favorite. And what you're looking for, and this is before we even look at the internals here, is to be to pay off 9K, you're going to have to, you know, probably be a minus 110 inside the distance or have a decent amount of wrestling upside. Now, Builder does have wrestling upside, um, although I would say that in his last fight, people were expecting him to do a little bit better with the wrestling. He basically just got, it was like one takedown or something. He was a little bit more, I don't know, he was kind of on the back foot for a decent amount of the, uh, I don't want to say a decent amount of the fight, but for an amount of the fight that, you know, uh, uh, people weren't expecting him to be on the back foot as much as he was. Now, he ended up winning pretty handily. But um, uh, I think he underperformed his wrestling piece. You know, they, they, he was a pretty popular underdog in general. And I, people, I think people expect him to go for more takedowns than he did, maybe. I don't know. But nonetheless, he's probably a decent play. Let's take a look at his odds here. So his inside the distance prop, let's see. Fight goes in general is minus 150 to finish. And his inside the distance prop is like plus one, looks like about a plus 130 or so. So I guess that's okay. Um, I guess he, this is the first kind of decent underdog that you can look at here, uh, favorite to look at. And what's interesting is you look at the other side of this, you have Nelson inside the distance about plus, somewhere between plus 275 and plus 320. And also he has some wrestling upside as well. So I think that this could be the first fight that you can actually target and target both sides. Um, neither fighter looks that great, which is probably going to keep their ownership somewhat low. But I think they both are good enough to, to include in your lineup. So I wouldn't mind fading the first two and starting your exposure in, 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 in fight three. And I would definitely take both sides of this. All right, uh, moving on, we have... Uh, uh, we have Aqualung against Amon Zahabi. Uh, I fear as though Aqu uh, you know, uh, our Richie Lang is going to be really popular. Uh, everybody's kind of talking about him, and um, his price is reasonable. So I, I think he's going to get a lot of ownership. We have to we have to watch this. We'll take a look at the the, the fight odds here. We have um, it's about a pick em. So maybe maybe because it's a pick 'em, you know, maybe people think of Zahabi maybe has some line value. 
fact is that Sahabi is going to be an extremely poor play from a DraftKings perspective. He's very, very low volume. He has, I'm pretty sure, a very, very poor inside the distance prop, and he's got no takedown upside. You look at his inside the distance prop, it's like plus 500 or something. That's like terrible. Aori's inside the distance prop is not that much better. I mean, he's plus 300. Um, he does have some takedowns, maybe. But I'll tell you this. Like if he turns out to be really popular, I think you can fade him. Um, I definitely think that he's the better play. I mean, certainly better than Zahabi in this matchup. And I think I think I do rate Zahabi as kind of a full fade here. Um, and yes, uh, Lang does have a decent inside the distance prop, but not great. He's got some takedown upside, but not great. And uh, gotta have to watch ownership on this one because, like I said, if he turns out to be really popular, I think you probably want to end up fading it. But you don't want to. But I don't think that um, Zahabi's got enough upside to fade him by by you know by getting that direct leverage so i guess in summary yes lang is the better richie lang is the better of these two from a draft kings perspective but if he turns out to be really high owned uh, i could see fading um so okay so if you're getting through these first like one two three four fights maybe only playing like one and a half guys it's not bad and then you get to this fight, which is Miranda Maverick versus Jasmine uh, Juridavicious. And you have a very, very healthy 9,300 on Miranda Maverick. Now, again, before we even look at the odds, you know, you're expecting her to be like a minus 300 or minus 240, something like that. But to pay off this price, she's going to need a really strong inside the distance prop or, you know, and probably a good amount of takedown upside. And... The problem with playing Maverick here is that from a style perspective, Jurvicious or Joda Vicious is not only just as good a wrestler as she is, but she's definitely a wrestler. So you, sometimes when you have two wrestlers going after each other, they kind of um, cancel each other out and it becomes more of a striking battle. Now, Miranda Maverick is clearly the better striker, but if all you have is Maverick's, you know, striking, then you're kind of left with this need for an inside the distance prop of, of minus 110. And if you look at it, it's like miserable. I mean, like her, she's like plus 350 or so to finish. And for a $9,300 fighter, that's that's really awful. And, and so you're going to need like her to win like a big old fashioned grappling, you know, and she's got to dominate. And I mean, you could argue that she's a better wrestler than Judah Vicious, but it it's not, you can't be sure about that. I mean, they're both decent wrestlers. Um, so I feel as though that she's probably not the greatest DraftKings play. Um, and and yet, on the other hand, I mean, Jared Abicious, I just don't, I just don't see her. I mean, she's plus, again, like 260 to win. It's, it's like 30%, something like that. And yeah, I guess if she wins, it's going to be because maybe she got more takedowns or something. I just don't see it. Um, is she a better... Okay, here's a better question. Is she a better play than... Um, what's his name? Than Ekreg in that first... You know, the second fight. They're both about 6,900. They, they both need to wrestle, I think, to win. And I'm also not sure that either of them have... are, are better wrestlers than their opponent anyway. Um, so... I think what kind of kind of gets me off of both these these plays is that their opponents are going to be not going to be that high owned i don't imagine so um i think i'm just kind of off of this fight so if you're following along here you have fade fade decent half fade fade so with 11 fights we need six fighters you know what's good is we're kind of pushing all this stuff back to kind of the better fights which i'm kind of like doing um, okay, let me just do something here in the background. Okay. All right, next fight up the card we have, and we're getting to the good stuff. You have Chris Curtis versus um, Nassim Imavov. And this is another one, which is a very poor DraftKings play, uh, fight. I mean, from a, a pricing perspective, Imavov at 
you know, 8,500, you're expecting him to be about, you know, minus 150 or so, you know. And at 8,500, what you're going to need is probably an inside the distance prop about plus 200, maybe plus 160 in, in, a, in, a, in a better world. Actually, you do probably need more like plus 160. Um, and if you want to play Curtis, you're going to want a 7,700 to have an inside the distance prop of about, again, about a plus 200 or so, plus 220, because neither of these fighters really have takedown upside. I guess Imabov has more of it. But Curtis is has a lot of, you know, has really, really superior takedown defense. This is just get rating to be a big old fashioned, you know, striking battle. And unless either of these, these, uh, these gentlemen have a really strong inside the distance prop, it's probably going to be a fade. And when you look at it, you'll see, um, like, let's look at the favorite first. Like, Imovov. Actually, not as bad as I thought. No, even Imovov inside the distance, like plus 300. I mean, that's brutal for this price. And Curtis inside the distance, like plus 375. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, this is this is awful. I mean, this just this fight, although it's kind of a you know, a decent technical fight, it's just a fade. So where are we gonna find our action, right? I, Sheets, you got me fading like three quarters of the fights on the card. Maybe not three quarters of them. But listen, we 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 talked about the Nelson Builder fight. Gave you half of a of a, of a play in the in the Arici Lang fight, and we're getting there. We're getting up to some good stuff. So you have Mark Andre Burial against Eric Anders. You have eighty four hundred against seventy eight hundred. So again, um, what are we looking at? Well, we expect Burials to get, be about a minus one fifty or so. And um, uh, for Burial to be a good play, he's got to have wrestling upside, which he does not in this spot. Um, or have an inside the distance prop of about a plus, like I said, about a plus 180 or so. And for Anders to be a good play, he's got to have a uh, takedown upside, which he actually does have. Okay. Um, or an inside the distance prop of about, about plus two, 250 or so. Um, so let's take a look and see what the internals look like. Mm. Well, his price is, I don't know, his price is kind of thin at minus 130. You might be able to make the case. Now, not quite. I was about to say Anders might even have some line value, but not quite. So inside the distance, you have burial inside the distance, plus 330 or something. This is just no good. He's the same as actually as Anders inside the distance. And Anders actually has some takedown upside. So I would say that this is a fight where I would either take the Anders side or nothing. Um, so we'll give this kind of like a half of a, of a fight, kind of like the uh, Richie Lang fight. So we'll give like, uh, you could play half of this one. But again, I think Burial is probably kind of a fade. All right, so here we go. We got one, two, three. We got four fights left. And honestly, I can make the case for playing all four of them. Um, these are going to be four really fun fights, I think. And I really think that you can set your exposures to play someone from all four of these. Um, and, and that, listen, you have to set your alarms, not set your alarms. You have to make sure that you're going to be up late, but it's kind of cool. You know, if you can get there with a two for two and you still have four fights left to go on your card. I mean, you could give yourself some hope, you know, unless listen, if you fade that first fight and, uh, what's her name? Oliveira, like subs are in the first round, gets 120 points, and we might have a problem. But if everything kind of plays out the way it's supposed to, you can have like four fights left with exposure to all of them. And that's kind of a fun way to watch MMA, honestly. So let's just start with uh, Dan Ige versus Nate Landwehr. So Ige at 9,100, he's going to need, again, about a minus 110 inside the distance prop um, to be relevant. And Nate Landwehr, 7,100, he doesn't need much. I mean, he's got to either have takedown upside or like a plus 330 inside the distance. And when you look at the at the internals here, let's take a look. You have Ige um, inside the distance is pretty close, you know. Depending on where you look, he's close enough to pick him to be relevant here. 
Um, he doesn't have the takedown upside, but whatever, he does have enough inside the distance to be relevant. And on the other side of this, you have Lan Weir. He doesn't really have the inside the distance prop, but he does have takedown upside. You know, if, if, if he's going to win this fight, he's going to bring pressure, and he's probably going to get some takedowns. And at 7,100, I mean, I think that's very, very strong here. So I, I think that you could definitely play both sides of this fight. Uh, I regard this fight as very similar in in viability to that third fight, which was the um, Builder Nelson fight. Um, as a matter of fact, I think they're very very close. Those two um, to, to to really target both of those. All right, now we have another real fun one: Mike Malott versus Adam Fugit. So this is kind of fun because Adam Fugit, he's going to try to win two fights that were fixed against him twice in a row. Like his last fight was when they debuted or they showed all these, these Asian fighters who, were, who won their Asian uh, regional scene uh, tournaments. And they were throwing Fugit to the dogs against Kinoshiga. Then he went off 7,200, like plus 250, and he buried him. I mean, he crushed him. Fugit just 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 owned him from the minute the bell rang. And now they are trotting on Mike Malott on Canadian soil as the next, you know, coming of Canadian, you know, uh, MMA heroism. And everybody's going to be like, like root for him. And he's like the next, you know, uh, whatchamacallit, the next, uh, the next big thing. And wouldn't it be awesome if you get just broke him also <laughs> it's his second straight fixed fight. That would be, that would definitely be quite a bit of fun. Um, now, when it comes to the uh, what you call it, the um, uh, the uh, the internals, okay. When it comes to the internals, for Mallet to be a good play, he's got to have an inside the distance prop of about minus one ten. Um, well, let's look at the price first of all. Um, not even. I mean, he's eighty eight hundred. I mean, he might even have line value at minus 200. So, so at 8,800, he's got an inside the distance prop of even less than that. Not to mention, now it's got some kind of takedown upside also. So this is, um, let's take a look at the internals here. And you'll see Mallet inside the distance is um, minus 135. I mean, this is a strong, strong play say the least. And then you have Fugit inside the distance at like plus 290. And he's got some takedowns too. Not to mention the fact that Mallot is going to be popular, which makes Fugit a really strong play. So I would really make sure to have 100% of this one. Don't just play Mallot. I would definitely play Fugit. And then we get to... Um, this next fight, which I really think you have to have 100% of. Like, there's there's no way. Now, again, you don't want to say no way, but this fight's finishing. It just is. Like, like this is going to be a really, really awesome fight, or at least it should be. Um, but forget the name value for a second. Like, Darius has a lot of grappling upside. Oliveira's got, uh, Oliveira's got a bunch of finishing upside and grappling. This fight is just going to score. Now, I don't know who's going to win. But his fight is definitely going to score regardless of who wins. So um, let's take a look, see if anybody's got line value. Darius at 8,600 should probably be a minus 140 or so, maybe a little bit more. He's about right. Let's look at the inside of distance prop here. Um, fight doesn't go is like minus 200. I mean, both these guys are great. I mean, Oliveira is plus 170 inside the distance. Darius also plus 170. If he's got grappling upside, you just have to have 100% of this. I mean, like, you just have to. Um, and I have no opinion one way or the other, which one's better. So, uh, uh, 50%, uh, 50 of each or something like that would work. Hold on, we got to fix something here. San Francisco, Colorado. Oh, we got plenty of time for that. We'll do it later. One second. Actually, I want to pause this for a second. Sorry about that. So, yeah, definitely pound this one, you know, 50% each or even, you know, a little more for, for Darius. Uh, but you definitely want both sides of this. 
And then the main event, you have uh, Amanda Nunez versus Irene Aldana. Um, and, you know, you have Amanda Nunez, who is a basic, like, a draft scoring machine, drafting scoring machine. Um, first of all, she's minus 300. She should be about, in a, considering it's a five-round fight, she'd probably be like 9,300, 9,400. It's close enough, 9,500. Because when you look, I mean, look at look at the way she scores. I mean, 150, 125, 150. Because 140, I mean, because she goes for the wrestling. You know? And and Aldana's been taken down a bunch of times. So if, in fact, Nunez wins, I mean, she's just rates to score really, really high. Okay. However, okay, you have to play both sides of this because unlike um, some of the other, you know, big favorites we talked about, Nunez is going to be a million percent owned for the reasons I just mentioned. I mean, who, no one's going to fade this, this game log, you know, plus her internals. You know, they look great. So as opposed to someone like Ekreg or Jazz DeVicious where – you know, if they win, you, they might not necessarily make the optimal and you get no leverage really because they're against, you know, uh, uh, low on fight, uh, low on fighters anyway. If you play Aldana and she gets the win, which she's going to get 30 percent of the time, she's going to be in the up. And, and, and well, I shouldn't say that 100 percent, but how is she not over a five round period to be able to 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 fight off all of the Nunez stuff enough? where she can get a decision or get a KO, she's going to score 100 points. And not only that, but she's going to score 100 beating the most popular fighter on the slate. Okay, so you have to play both sides of this. Even though Nunez does rate to win like a a huge amount of the time, you have to play both of these. So, listen, in 150 max, I'm not saying fade anything. You know, just play pretty much whatever you want. You know what I mean? Shouldn't say whatever you want. You should get obviously less exposure on the on the fighters they didn't like. But you know, when it comes to like how you can really play this and have fun, you play both sides of the Aldana fight, both sides of the Darius fight, both sides of the Mala fight, both sides of the Ige fight, and that's four of your lineups right there. Okay. And then if you want, okay, like both sides of the Nelson fight, if you wanted to, and then play only out. Uchi Lang, and then only from this other fight, Anders or something like that. And you can reduce your pool like really, really small by doing that. Um, now, again, I'm not saying that you have to play that way, but I think the way that the card breaks down from a DraftKings perspective, I think it's a fun way to attack the slate. And I think I might do that. But we shall see. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to be doing, or later tonight, I'm going to be doing a betting breakdown where I go through kind of a contrarian approach to uh, finding good uh, good value. Uh, But until then, uh, good luck, everybody.